aren't even reporting their real numbers. So it's like, yeah, they're reopening. Hey, hey what's boy. up? How's Look it going? at this stud. Um, it's so good all of you. Do you realize the t-shirt I'm wearing? Nice. Oh fuck yeah! Just a heads up, we're recording now, guys. So um, say what's up. Hey everybody. Hello. <clears throat> um, let's get right into this. For us, PT and I were just shooting the shit, but um, can you make, like, I just want to start by introducing Faraz as a, a, m- a member of our community. He's not at NCR right now, but he was at NCR for a long time. Most of the OGs probably remember who he is. Um, if you've ever done a class with it, you'll probably never forget him. If you've ever done a class with Faraz, you'll probably never forget him because um, he, he doesn't shut up when the coaches are trying to coach. Yeah, the coaches definitely remember. And, and I want you to know, Faraz, we actually still have a, a, a Christmas party award named after you, the Faraz Khalid Award. That means a lot to me. For the person who won't stop talking when the coaches talk. I still don't stop talking, by the way. You should talk to my new cost, Jim. They have the same problem. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Faraz, why don't you um, – so you're the first podcast that we're doing kind of since we've, we've gone into quarantine or, or social isolation, whatever you want to call it. Can you maybe just start by telling people who don't know who you are, like um, what your role is in all this? Like you've been on the news almost daily. Um, so go ahead and, and tell people what you do. Uh, first of all, thanks for being part of this. I've been following your podcast for a long time. I'm so proud of you boys for taking a leadership positions. You were actually one of the first gyms in the country that took the advice of closing down. And I think that it's such not an easy decision. I talked about you often to people who come to me asking whether they should close their business. And I always say, listen, I have examples of people who this is their only sole income. Uh, it's a small business. And they did that tough decision because they understand that all of us are have a role to play in this. So uh, to answer your question, I'm a medical doctor and a health policy expert in population health risk and assessment. Things like coronavirus is my line of work. Uh, I look into how can we get ahead of pandemics and big crises that happen in the world. Uh, really, the best way to describe me is a knowledge translator. So my job is simple, is to take this complex information that's out there, the insane number of fake news that's circulating around, and try to get the bottom of things. How do we communicate this complex information in a very simple language so that everybody can understand it? You know, like Even myself, who's been trained to understand this complex information, I'm still having a hard time getting reliable information and really getting down the bottom of this. You should see the number of emails I get on a daily basis of people asking me the craziest things and they always have an insane amount of evidence behind it. And then when you start looking through it, you're like, how is anybody supposed to know what's true or not anymore? And so people like me, and there's many like me who are really trying to get at that. So trying to provide reliable information sometimes we might get it wrong but for the most part we really try to be very accurate in the information we're transmitting that's awesome yeah because because pt and i were talking before you logged on about how there's so much information out there available on this virus and a lot of it is kind of has a negative tone to it right it's not very optimistic um and we're kind of just like we were just talking about how we we value guys like you who provide us with this like actual, you know, factual based evidence based knowledge on this whole thing. Um, so yeah, thank you for doing what you do. You're um, do you, uh, so, so, so for us, let me, let me ask you, so all, all this work that you're doing right now, is that for, uh, is that a part of the university or is this for the world health organization? What, uh, who you represent right now? Yeah, I'm smiling because if you know, if you've been following me on the media, I mean, I've been doing so much press. And by the way, I have to say that I say no to 10 out of 20 things that come my way. Like, I'm not saying yes to everything because I'm trying to be careful where I invest my energy. Uh, to answer your question, I'm part of McMaster University. So uh, that's really my official designation. But it's funny because I've, as I noticed how they introduced me in different outlets, they're using different universities. So at one point, I'm from Wolfram Laurier, second point of WHO. So and, and and to be quite honest, you boys know me very well. I don't care for what people, how they announce me. Even the funniest thing, the PT, I keep getting from people is like they keep saying your name wrong. Uh, and it's true, they're butchering my name all across the board. But you can't be held up on that. Like, I'm just, my job is, if you want to know more about me, you can find me online. I'm very easily accessible. So I let go of where people think I'm from. But yes, I've worked for WHO for many years. That's where I started my career. And for those of you who don't know what WHO stands for, it's the World Health Organization, the central health authority in the world that's really mandating and trying to get ahead of this pandemic in Geneva, Switzerland, is their headquarters with branches all around the world. 
But I've also worked with Doctors Without Borders who are in charge of emergency response. So they do things that are all about things like Ebola and SARS outbreaks and natural disasters and earthquakes. And now Doctors Without Borders are taking a leadership position in uh, coronavirus because they realize that this is transcends borders. Uh, and so I try to couple, I'm that one, the odd person that sits in between academia and field practice. Uh, and it's funny because at the beginning I felt, I mean, I can share this because this is a family conversation I find. I felt very uncomfortable how I got in the middle of coronavirus. <laughs> it caused a bit of a, sh a shock system because even my closest friends and network were like, we know you do this stuff, but we didn't understand all this attention. Like, where is this coming from? How did you? And I said, you know, I published an article. This all started two weeks ago, the conversation, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, in the academic world, it's like the guru, the it place to go to for experts. So people who are academics and researchers or are highly uh, expert level in a certain area, publish on specific topics. The editors of the conversation reached out for me to, to write an article about five ways we can use evidence to help address coronavirus. They chose coronavirus. Uh, back then, it wasn't as big as it is now. They chose coronavirus because they wanted something that people can understand and relate to. So I took my work, which is all about crisis zones. My whole research work for the past four years has been about crisis. So whether it's natural disasters or things like coronavirus, and adopted it to it. Uh, and from there, things exploded. Uh, I think people realize, and it's crazy, PT, I'll tell you this. And I will take much more time to reflect post-COVID, but it's insane to me how people on the media, so, you know, you'd speak to Lisa LaFlam or CTV News or Global News, off air, they tell you, um, my God, we've been, we've been so like hungry for somebody to break the stuff to us. And it sort of like hit me. I was like, oh my God, you know, we think people have that knowledge. We think there are teams that are doing this, but in reality, we're so far behind from this. Even in academic institutions, big corporate companies, I speak to people at Nordstrom, you know, which is arguably one of the best companies in the world, and they still don't have the evidence to help inform their policies. So whoever out there is listening to this and thinking, I can't believe there's this guy, his name is Frost, and he's trying to translate that knowledge, surely that exists. Let me tell you that doesn't exist. And if you're looking for a place to contribute to the world in the future, that's really it. Like find ways to get this knowledge that we have so much of, uh, translate it in simple ways to help people inform their answers. And this might be a bigger question, but do you think it's, that, that's maybe one of the reasons why all the information that we, that we had on the coronavirus uh, was not necessarily taken or was taken with a grain of salt and wasn't necessarily taken seriously? You know, because we saw a lot of stuff on there like since January and, and you know, some were taking it seriously. Some were just saying, ah, whatever. It's just another, you know, forest fires in Australia that everyone's going to get behind and it's going to disappear and nobody's going to talk about it in a month, you know? So um, do you think that's why there's not enough, you know, translation of all that knowledge of, of the technical stuff? Yeah. And I think it's overwhelming. So I remember my first week of doing press, uh, I tried to be very factual, obviously. And even me trying to find evidence. And I have resources that most people don't have that cost a lot of money to have them to begin with. Uh, I thought I was overwhelmed. I was like, I needed to develop, I sort of had to like spend one whole day trying to develop a strategy of where am I gonna go to get the most reliable info? So now two weeks in, I have a system. So I was telling Reza, I was messaging him. He's like, you know, when you guys were ready, I was like, give me a minute. I'm just gonna update all my figures. And if you see my office right now, it's just a wall of like figures and numbers and like graphs because that's that's it, right? Like w w you have to find a system where you can get the information. So uh, I don't, I empathize with anybody who's trying to make tough decisions and not being able to find the information, the accurate ones. Uh, just before I spoke to you guys, I got an alert from the United Arab Emirates of some colleagues there. Uh, news are circulating that people should not be eating meat and vegetables, uh, meat and eggs. And I, I was like, you're kidding, right? Like, I was like, this is a joke. Like you're, you're laughing, right? And they're like, no, no, we need you to make a statement. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, we need you to make a statement. I was like, I can't believe that this is even a question. And even yesterday I was on, I don't know if you guys saw, but I was on Global News and they wanted me to talk about hand sanitizer and lowering immunity in children. I couldn't, I was just baffled. I called my doctor <laughs> providers and I said, and I actually told the reporter and he was awesome, and Tony Roberts. Uh, I said, listen, like, I'm, I know you've been asking me to talk about this. I'm not comfortable talking about it because I think it's gonna send the wrong signal. And that's the other thing we need to be careful of. People like you guys, people in leadership positions have to be so critical 
about the words you you have no idea the influence you're having on people that's my big message i think today like whatever capacity you are functioning in even if you don't have a leadership position but you have a platform by that i mean you have a social uh, networking website so you have an instagram account a snapchat please be careful what you circulate please be very conscious of the information you're putting out there you think it's just to your close friends but you don't know who they know and who they're going to disseminate that knowledge and so the message goes across very fast so we have to be so critical about the words we're coming we're putting out there i'm glad you shared that thanks man yeah i i agree with you 100 percent. there's a lot of a lot of fake news on top of other bullshit that's circulating the media right now and uh yeah it's good to to kind of people will believe whatever they read right like mm-hmm. you there's an article out there that that will tell us that this is over next week. And there's another one out there that'll tell us that this is going to last six months. Like anything you look for, you can find out there. So it's, I, I'm happy you said that. Thank you. I have a question. If you don't mind, I want to interrupt. Like I've been dying to ask this for you three and I've been waiting for it. Can I, can you detail, I'm not sure you've already done this. How did you get to the point of making that bold decision? I think that's a big question that like people who've been following NCR, even random people, I live in Toronto now and, NCR, it's so funny to me how I started my CrossFit journey with you boys. I will never forget my first class walking into the gym and Reza was coaching and came down and I said, hey, I heard about this like CrossFit thing. Uh, I really want to try it out. And I was like so intimidated because Reza didn't have his shirt on and he's like a muscle, all muscle. I was like, I can't do that. Like, this is not going to work out for me. Uh, and fast <laughs> forward now, six, seven years later, I always say people ask me, like, oh, where did you CrossFit? And for some reason, my snobby self will never give credit to my other gyms that I've been to throughout my life. After cross- And I'll always go back to NCR. I'm like, I'm from NCR. <laughs> and the reaction Whoa. to different people all the time. And they're like, wow, you know, like, they're legends. Like, I swear to you, I promise you, every single person I meet will always be like, that's who you go to. Like, we're, we're getting inspiration from them. We follow them closely. And I was like, wow, those boys have done an incredible job. So uh, sorry to go on for so long. But it no, might thanks, question. Rod. Yeah, I know. It's true. How did you get there? Because I know I spoke to Pete. And then next thing you know, it, you made this bold decision. Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was a, honestly a long process. Like, to... Um, Pete, Pete and, and Jen have been following this super closely since the beginning and almost to a point where Pete was like, you know, predicting some crazy ass things to us that were like completely insane. Yeah. And then turned out that some of them actually happened. So it was, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was a little insane at first. And then as you know, it, it started getting more serious and more serious. Um, I guess Reza and I started listening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then as we started listening and, and finding out what was going on, you remember I, I sent you a message. I'm like, man, there's so much noise out there. Mm-hmm. Like, I trust you. I know you're in this. Like, what do we do now? You know, like, don't help me predict what we're going to be in six months. Like, I don't want to know the death rate or this. Like, what can I do now for my gym, for my community that, that, that will help? And your message was awesome, right? And, you know, we, we started using some of those strategies right away. Um, and then essentially what happened is I, myself and Pete were going to Montreal for a competition, uh, the March 13, 14, 15. And on the way there, um, that's when the Quebec government like really started. And this was the day after Trump, uh, made his speech or addressed to the nation. And then, uh, the Quebec government started closing down or banning, uh, groupings of more than 250 people. Um, And then that's when we, that, that event got canceled. So I came home the next day and that's when we really started to take a look at what, what can we do if we know that they're starting to ban um, gatherings of 250 people, like that's going to come down to hundred people at some point and then 50 and how can we get ahead of this and do our part, you know, and, and we know that as a gym, our, you know, our classes get big and, you know, I'm not an expert, but I could probably say that the, the, the gym environment is not the most sanitary, even if we try and be as sanitary as possible. I mean, you, you know, just like anybody else, like the, the gyms are, are filthy. Um, so that, that was the Friday, right, Rez? And, and we were just yeah. like going back and forth. And then we figured out, let's wait the weekend. No, it was. I don't, it was, I, I don't remember who said it, but we said, hey, we're, if we're going to close down Monday, might as well close down now. Like the effect that we want to be to have on monday 
you know, there's, we could get ahead of it and do our part, you know, two days before, you know? So at that point we're like, Hey, if we're going to close, let's fuck it, it, close yeah. right now. Let's set the example. Let's be leaders. And, um, uh, that's what we did. It was the, it was actually the Friday night where we, we pulled the plug and Saturday was yeah. closed. We had nothing. So yeah, yeah, it started, it started out as like, um, we had a prime timers class, which is like, uh, for older athletes. And we, on the Thursday, we, they all showed up for class and I told them all to go home. And, um, it just, from that point, like that was the first, like kind of major thing we did was like basically sending them home. Cause we knew that they were, um, a vulnerable sector. And then, uh, the boys, like their event got canceled and we're like, we were all kind of like, holy shit, this is escalating quickly, um, for, for the, an event of that magnitude to get closed. Um, and we all just, were just like, you know what, what's the point? You know, we have one class on sa- Sunday, a couple classes on Saturday, let's just end this. And, uh, and, and basically let's be leaders in the community, right? Like we, if you, if you look at where this thing is going and where it has gone in other countries, um, they all end up basically with everything closed down. So that's what we did. And, uh, yeah, it was scary. It was, it was, uh, it's, it's still scary, but, um, th- yeah, that's how we did it. And then, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, I think, you, I think you, yeah, go ahead. BT. I was just going to say to finish up there, like essentially the easy part was to decide to close the hard part was decide to what to do with the membership. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, that was it. Like, yeah, we know we have to close. We have to reduce human interaction. We have to make sure that people are staying safe and not transmitting this. Um, but now what do we do? Like, do we pause memberships? Do we keep charging people? So that was, that was the, the hard part. So once we decide, okay, we're going to close. Now we, you know, us three, we got our heads together for, you know, we actually still have our heads together every single day trying to figure all, all this out. But that's when we like really initiated a real plan for the closure and, and plan for three weeks, for a month, for six months, if we have to. And can I ask, uh, so you did, I mean, you were the, as my knowledge, you were one of the first people's period and business wise in Canada to have done that bold move. You have to understand that like, I was in touch with the government on a regular basis. Nobody was talking about closing up. And I remember getting that message from me. I don't know where I saw, it. I think it was on Instagram or Facebook and my jaw dropped. And I remember calling some of my friends and be like, Ooh, that's bold. Like, I wonder what made them do that. Like I was, it actually shocked me a little bit because nobody else was doing it. Literally not the single other business was really getting on this. And so for you boys to pull the block and I thought, Oh, they must be, having knowledge of some circumstances. How are you doing in terms of the members? Like, did you put a, a, a hold on people's membership? And how have the members responded to this? Because that's the biggest concern now. How do you sustain the business? Count on for us to turn this podcast on us and not him. I mean, those are questions, burning questions that I've had. So I'm going to take the advantage of this and get the answer. <laughs> yeah, PT, you want right, to take right that? Before you, right, yeah, right before you got on, I said, hey, Rez, let's make it about him, not us, all right? <laughs> Oh man, you know, I think the the boutique fitness is is filled with strong communities. Everyone feels super um, strongly about their community, so everyone was very very supportive right off the bat. Um, and we decided to pause all memberships because we right off the bat we're like, hey, we're not going to be providing a service or the same service that we normally do, so we got to pause it. Um, and then from there, we didn't backtrack, but we, we realized that if this does go for longer than we think, then we have to figure out, um, a little bit of a plan to last longer. So what I mean by that is before we decided to close on our doors, like we, we did all the due diligence we, we needed to in terms of finances and, and know how long we're going to, we'd be able to last with zero revenue, who we'd be able to still pay. Could we still pay rent? So like, we're basically all ready. And I like, you could look back at the conversations between the three of us and it was like, should we pull it? Should we do that? And it was like, okay, we can do this because of this much. And you know, we'll be able to still do this and that. And like, so our plan was like very set. And once we figured all that out, it was, I think the right call was to, to just pause all membership mm. uh, and not give the, not give our members the option to have to ask us to pause their memberships. I didn't want to put anybody in that situation. I wanted to reverse it. I wanted to have control on that. Um, 
because then you're kind of making people feel bad. And I, I get it. And this is what I've been telling affiliate owners all week. Like I get it. People want to support their gym and people online are like support hashtag support local businesses. Yeah, of course. Right now, you know, what if this does last two, three, four months? Like people are going to start looking at their personal finances and be like, well, can I spare that 175 bucks a month to NCR? Cause I'm not going anymore. You know, I, I love those guys, but fuck, I got to put food on my table too. So like, that's when I'm like, we're going to take that decision. We're going to pause it. And then we're going to figure it out how, how to take care of our own, our own families. And, and, and that, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Raj. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree uh, with everything you're saying. Like it's uh, I actually have friends who uh, I have a friend who owns a retail store and like, he's not in the same situation we're in. Right. Like he, he's already thinking about putting food on the table. Um, so it's a no, it was a no brainer for us. Right. Like we're, we're not giving people the service. Um, and even, even today, like we have some, we have, our community is so strong and it's full of some of the best humans I've ever met in my entire life. And, uh, like PT was saying, he got into a fight with a couple of our members who wanted that wanted us to take their membership off hold just, just to support us. And it's like, we got, we're, we're all, we're super fair guys. Right. So, um, then that's kind of where the equipment thing came into play. It's like, well, there's a lot of people begging us to, to, to help us. So it's like, well, let's, let's see how we can help them. Cause then we, then we don't feel as bad about taking their membership off. Well, we're going to give them something in return. So we, that's when we started to rent out the equipment. And that was, uh, that was just kind of us on the fly thinking of ways to help our members during this time. And, um, it ended up, it ended up being awesome. And it's, it is still is awesome. Um, they're helping us. We're helping them. Um, it, it's, it's, amazing. it's great. I, yeah. that, it's, As somebody so, who's to translate that knowledge, I hope that you boys take the time to look, put that out there because I tell you, my gym here in Toronto is called Lyft. I don't, I don't know if you boys know it. Uh, and Lyft have been also trying to be leaders in this community, but I can see that they are also trying to struggle because they're, I mean, Toronto rent is insane, right? Like mm -hmm. that rent is beyond insane. And our membership fees here, you say PT 175 for NCR, uh, Lyft is about 280, something like that. And that's normal and average for Toronto. That's, that's average. Not. For Toronto. But they're not overcharging. They're just the regular guys and they're doing an incredible job. They, they actually are the ones who also told me when I joined, like we look at the NCR model and we always admire their, their leadership and what they do. But they struggled making that decision, you know. Uh, they just announced this week that they will take that position of suspending everybody's membership, putting on hold. But it took them some time because I relate to what they, uh, the struggles they go through. Like, how are you supposed to pay rent? And yes, okay, the government has stepped up. There's a stimulus plan uh, to help small business owners. Uh, but that's tricky. Even today, if you notice the list of Ontario's essential services, gyms were not included. Uh, yeah, pretty so, much everything was included on that list except for gyms. Yeah, and it's, it's very odd. So us people in health policy are now sort of in conversation all morning trying to figure out, well, why was that excluded? Was that already part of like, oh, gyms should have been already closed? I think my gut instincts are telling me and my knowledge is that it's because the assumption is like what PT started this conversation saying, gyms are automatically assumed to be one of those high, high hazard places, keep people are in close contact bodily the fluids, they're not the cleanest. So the assumption there is that they're already shut. I mean, I'd be shocked if there's a gym open now. I mean, I don't know, to my knowledge, most gyms are closed. Uh, and so I hope that my message to you boys, that if you allow me to say so, is that please find a way to, to translate that knowledge. Your leadership in this has been remarkable. And the lessons you just shared in this podcast needs to go on a list. You need to share that because there's so many gyms out there, small businesses that can learn so much from that. How do you take a leadership position when the information is not there, right? Uh, you, how do you think totally. yeah that's gonna yeah be i mean at, at the end of the day it's kind of funny like we're we're kind of considered a health like we're our bet we want people to become healthier that's why we have a gym right we invite people through our doors to make them healthier um what kind of message is a gym sending uh when there's this like a pandemic right like if we want you to be healthier and we're keeping our doors open like we're not really we're our it's clear that our underlying message is not the public health. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope there's no gyms open. Um, yeah. And the question I guess now is longevity, right? So we're hearing yeah. reports from the government that we're not looking at a couple of weeks. We're looking at a possibly a few months uh, of what's going on right now. And there's a big concern. We know at least in Ontario up until April, we, we're looking at shutting down everything. And, and, and I will say this, that 
the draconian measures, which would, by that I mean that more strict measures on control of freedom of us being able to leave our houses and attend services will become more strict. The numbers are alarming. Like I remember starting this two weeks ago and looking at the numbers following the minute by minute and thinking, okay, we have a chance to get ahead of this. This doesn't look bad. And today we're at 2,000 numbers. 2,000 people in Canada right now are COVID plus and increasing by the minute. Yesterday we saw the highest exponential number of growth and number of cases in one day, which is why Ontario announced the complete closure of everything right now because we do not want to get to Italy and we definitely don't want to get to the U.S. level. So for all uh, businesses out there and academics and everybody who's, you know, has jobs and things to attend to prepare for a couple of weeks, if not months, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister on Thursday was very uh, sort of telling in his statement when asked, how long do you think this is going to be? And, and I really appreciate his answer. He said, you know, listen, two weeks to months, we're preparing for months. So if the government is preparing for months, Mm -hmm. uh, so does everybody else should be now putting their plans and and i think what's really key to bring up at this point is people like you who and your gym who's been able to figure out a model to get ahead of this with their finances and what they can leverage keep that hold tight to that because as somebody whose bread and butter is crisis zones let me tell you this is not the first one and not the last one we know for a fact that crises are on the rise. We know that we're only going to have more and more, unfortunately, of things like Corona. That's not to be negative. That's just to say that we need to put in place systems that are able to adapt to this. And we can get ahead of this. You know, we've had SARS and we got through it. We got Ebola. We got through it. So that's not the issue here. The issue is this is pushing everybody, including you guys, to put in place systems so that when this happens again in a different scale, I mean, this time it was an infectious disease. Next time it could be climate change uh, factor uh, we need to be able to address that past cool really good point yeah so for us before we before we go um i i don't want to have you try and predict anything but when it's time for for us to to go back and to reopen and to you know go back to business as usual like what would be what would you have in terms of uh, advice you know you gave us advice on on uh, before closing and what we should do to minimize the, I guess, the spread there. But when it's time to reopen, like what are the measures that we could take or that uh, an affiliate owner could take or another gym owner could take to uh, help, still help, but still be open? That's an excellent question, PT. I think the two, but my first advice will be to keep the loyalty of your members. Uh, and by that, I mean being transparent, which I think you have done. So continue on that route because I think the biggest problem you're going to have is retention. Of, uh, and as amazing as the community is, I love what you said. At the end of the day, people have bills to pay. So that transparency in what you're doing, being very forward with your information, which, by the way, I will tell you, uh, uh, Canada is, is being remarked now and applauded for being so good at being transparent with our information, daily briefings, daily. Other countries are not doing that, huh? We're the only country so far that's been so good at like getting that information out. So the same thing applies to you. Maintain that level of transparency of what's going on. Share with your members your plan, your vision. Uh, don't bombard them, but keep sharing with them. Keep that connection going of saying, you know, we understand this might take longer. This is what we have planned. And it is evolving. And it's okay to say that and say, you know, I mean, if the government can say that, why can you not say that? You know, plans change depending on figures and data. We're continuously assessing. We're continuously assessing the situation and we'll adapt accordingly. Our main concern is to have the benefit of all of you at our heart, our core. But once you come back and you're open to regular business, which we will, it won't be long from now that everybody will be back at NCR, the doors will be filled. Uh, I think practicing safer measures, it's a good idea. And by that, I mean limiting class size and distance between athletes. I think we're going to see more of that. I think this, this coronavirus has sort of pushed us all to think of that. So, you know, um, cleaning equipment. I, CrossFit is my favorite thing to do in the world. So I always think about, like, how good are we about cleaning bars? And can we, you know, but I noticed in my gym, because Lyft took longer to close than you guys. So we were still going to CrossFit during the craziness. And I was noticing, like, how many people are actually washing their hands? Right? So like not a lot. And even though I was the annoying person going around, Jim was doing an incredible job of telling people, please wash your hands, clean the bars. That I think is going to be key. I think the budgets of any gym now is going to go a lot into cleanliness. So like uh, somebody to make sure the gym is clean after, uh, overnight, uh, urging the members to clean their bars. That's going to be important and limiting your class size. I, those are going to be two key things. And I will say that last advice I'll give on that is 
if you are an, uh, an innovative gym, start thinking about incorporating technology. So uh, think quickly about how you're gonna uh, get ahead of this in the future for any case. So can you do a, a, an adopted model, a blended model? That's gonna be really, that's what we're talking about right now because even the educational system, a lot of our courses are face-to-face -face, and we've been forced, forced. I mean, it's been a torture to move them all online. And the conversation now is, should we not have more what we call blended learning, which is half face-to-face, -face, half online, or at least have them built in a way that they seamlessly go together. So for gym owners, can you not do what you're doing now, a mixture? So people can come to the gym, but you can also do a virtual. I mean, you can, people can pay for that, right? Like if you have the equipment at home, which we're seeing now, so many people are buying stuff for their home gyms. I mean, you should see my groups. People are like, I'm buying this on Amazon. I'm buying this. I'm getting this. People are going to build up their home gyms more. So could you not technically then offer a membership where people, you videotape like you're doing right now, that work out, somebody can do it from home. Yeah. You might not have the biggest number, but that's something to really consider, to have that new technology already in place. And that's, that's really interesting to say that because you look at like business models like Peloton that have been like blowing up lately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to look at those things and say like, man, that's, you know, people want to interact. Like that's why our gym is full because people want to interact with people. They want to, you know, be, you know, in the same room. They want to compete. And now it's like, what if not only people not, won't necessarily want to interact with other people face to face, but what if they can't? That's, that's a, you know, so it's like almost blending that necessity. It's like, what if at one point we're told we can't do this? So that, that's when we have to adapt. And a lot of gyms are doing that. Like, like you're saying, online classes, uh, pre-recorded classes, and we're kind of dabbling with that too. We're, we're a little bit behind the curve actually on that because some classes, some gyms really adopted that right away. Like they closed down like class tomorrow, boom. And I thought that was really cool. Like a lot of gyms reacted way quicker than we did on that. But I think they kind of had to because they didn't pause the membership. So they still felt like they needed to, like, you know, give that service. Um, but still, like, it's, it's, you're right. It's having a blended membership of, like, hey, you can come to the class and. Um, oh, look at that. Yeah, self pity, boys. Self pity. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's going to be. Uh, I, we're gonna I, have I, really take a look at our business. Like uh, Peloton shares have skyrocketed. A lot of my friends who have a lot of money because they're not cheap, Pelotons, have bought them the past two days. Yeah. Like they were on the fence of buying them and then they went and you should see that they're all sending me videos of them on their bikes. Uh, and I've been asking them, give me feedback, give me reviews on it. And they're like, uh, and they're like avid spinners. Like they go to sleep class every day. And you know, they're like my rich friends from Dubai. <laughs> I will say that because that shit is not cheap. Uh, and so they're like, no, this is awesome. It's like, it feels like a class. I won't do it all the time. Like, this will be nice for the days where I have the kids at home and I can't go to the gym or the days where I came late from a flight, you know, cause you're jet setting or something. But the same, I mean, you look at Toronto's demographic, everybody works from home or remote. Like everybody's traveling all the time for work now. Everybody's never in one place for a long time. Memberships, gyms are trying to incentivize people to come to the gym every day by doing like gains walls and all that. The pulse is there. We are going to see more and more people need to adaptive lifestyle and I'm not saying that everybody's going to want to do technology I agree with you people love the community sense but it's nice on a Sunday when you're just like I don't want to go to the gym weather is crap it's snowing uh, I can pay 50 bucks a month to my gym to have both in class and the online portion right and so yeah. you go in and you see the class and you do it at home you still feel like that part of community I've been doing some days my gyms Instagram so they've been doing every day a workout and actually, it felt like I was in the class because it's the same coach, right? So the coach is the same. So you still feel like, oh, okay, I can't do this for a long time. But I was like, okay, I feel like I'm in the class. He's talking to me like I'm in the class and I'm in it and I'm listening to his music because they play their, the same music. So it gives you that sense. So I do think there's something there for sure. We, well, we, we're, we're offering one every single day now. So um, you'll, you'll have to jump in on one of our classes. Yeah, we're going to send you the link for one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have to pay for it? <laughs> no. Um, cool, man. Thanks. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to quickly talk to you about that bullying thing that you're going through, but I don't want to keep you for too long. Uh, bullying, which bullying thing out there's a lot going on. Oh like yes. The 49 year old. Yeah. Yeah. 
Let's what the hell is going on? Live because just in okay. case that All person right. she tunes in. But that problem escalated more and more. And I think the message there is that anybody who's trying to support people who are still getting their jobs done, please support them by going easy on them. Understand yeah. that people have a lot of things that they're trying to take care of, whether it is a business owner who's trying to figure out how to put meal and address their clients. So calm down on the communications with people. I think that's the big message and figure out what's priority and what's important right now. Awesome. Thanks. Well, me. dude, I think that's good. That that was that was a good chat. Um yeah, like I said, we'll send you a link for our next uh, at home workout and we count on you jumping in. Of course, happy to do so. Thanks Say hi a lot for me us. and Colin I really, really miss them. I can't wait to come to Ottawa. Oh, Enjoy we can't that. wait to see you, man. Thanks, guys. And Reza, right. the last yeah. comment. Yes. You need to get a better background. <laughs> Dude, this is I made this office in like the I last know. I actually put up I put up a picture today. Look, I put up a Spider Man picture. I All love right. PTs. PTs look so professional with a world map and the white background. And then Reza, you have a bike, a trash bag, a Christmas tree, and some <laughs> Weird bot. I'm like, this can't be more cross pay. He's in his garage doing this video. That's amazing. Dude, That's I'm amazing. literally in the basement. My background right now, you can't see it, but it's pink insulation. Oh, that so, probably would have been a better background. <laughs> I, I, I legit brought the front desk computer into my basement. Good for you. You got to do what you he was, to do. Yo, he was doing everything on a, on a goddamn iPad and kept like using it as an excuse. I can't do this on an iPad. Get yourself a computer. Like, let's go. <laughs> Thank God for people like PT in your life, Reza. Oh my God. Love you, boy. Keep in touch. All right, man. Love you, man. Miss you, dude. Take care. See ya. Bye.